her as a child. And now she stands there helpless to stop the taunting, helpless to soothe his pain. As Mary looked up at Jesus on the cross, her heart surely broke. And as he looks at his mother, his responsibility to her has to be in the front of his mind. Remember, as the oldest son, it was Jesus' responsibility to provide for his family after his father died. Women at that time couldn't work or inherit their husband's estate. It fell to the oldest son to provide for his mother. And with this responsibility in his heart, Jesus looks out and sees his mother from the cross and diverges from his mission of forgiveness and salvation and moves to her and her care. He said, woman, here's your son. And in that act, Jesus is demonstrating for us the priority of family and, and our responsibility to them and for them. It's a bedrock responsibility rooted in the Ten Commandments. You surely remember that the first four have to do with our relationship with God. No other gods, no idols, respect God's name, remember the Sabbath. And the last five have to do with our relationship with others. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not covet. And then there's that pivot point at the fifth. Honor your father and your mother. Jesus is slowly suffocating and dying on the cross for the sins of the world, and he stops long enough to draw on his waning energy to make sure his mother is going to be taken care of. Here is your son now. Standing next to his mother, he sees John, the only disciple who's come to the cross. Jesus turns to John and says, this is your mother now. Jesus on the cross dying for us. And he turns to John and asks him to be his substitute. Please take care of my mother. Physically, Jesus was limited in this hour. His strength and breath diminishing. He can't help himself, but he can still help his mother. He has no hands now but John's hands. No feet but John's feet. He has no arms to hold his mother but John's arms. He's no way to comfort or care or provide for his mother, but through John, behold, this is your mother now. And Luke, or John, tells us that from that moment on, the disciple took Mary into his own home. Weeks later, after the resurrection, Jesus did the same kind of thing. When Jesus was mentoring the disciples for the mission ahead, he told them it was time for them for him to go. But don't worry, I'm sending a substitute, the Holy Spirit, who will enable you to carry on my mission to be my arms and legs, my feet and my heart. Jesus took care of his mother. He took care of his disciples. He took care of his mission. And here's where it gets real for you and me. You and I are the spiritual descendants of those first disciples. And the mantle has been passed. It's on us. Jesus has chosen you to carry on his work, to further his kingdom. Jesus has chosen you to be his hands, his feet and his arms for each other and for the world. <coughs> Jesus chooses those who love him. The Gospel of John tells us that John was the disciple Jesus loved. And he was the one Jesus asked to care for his mother. Jesus chooses those who make themselves available. John's the only disciple at the cross. 
Jesus didn't have a lot of options. He may not have been the most capable, but he was the one who was most available because he had shown up. He was there. Notice something. Jesus doesn't call us, and then we make the decision to make ourselves available. We have to make the decision of availability first, and then Jesus calls us. Then Jesus commissions us. You spend a lot of time with anyone, you get to know them well, right? And that's what happened with John and Jesus. They had developed this deep relationship. And we can too. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more we learn to love Him in new ways and become aware of His will for us. And what he's asking us to do and to be. And the more that we then respond in love to his ever increasing call upon our lives. What an honor and an opportunity we are offered. We're given the chance to participate in God's work. To love as Jesus loved. As he loved his mother. Love John, love his disciple, love the world, loves you. There's something powerful that happens when we connect to that love. Our love within the body of Christ becomes, if we let it and if we own it and if we live it, it becomes a witness that Jesus is alive right here in our midst. And it calls others to him like a magnet. It becomes contagious. And it has the power to change the lives of others because the risen Lord is among us and in our life together. You know that. You've seen it. You've experienced it. There's a story about two Cal Poly classmates, Charles and Alan. Charles tells the story. He says, Alan and I met 20 years ago. We were both students at Cal Poly. I was a freshman, he was a junior. As a physics major, Alan was both incredibly intelligent and articulate. How Alan got on with his studies, however, is still a mystery to me because he was virtually blind. He could not see well enough to get from one place to another on campus without help. But when it came to reading, it was a different story. I could still see Alan with his face two inches from the text, arduously pecking away at each of his assignments. Alan not only got straight A's, but also returned to Cal Poly as a physics professor. Although Jewish in background, Alan was extremely skeptical of anything religious, especially Christianity. He was well-read and well-versed, and he argued his doubt like a scientist. Alan believed that Christianity was unable to pass the theological requirements of science. There simply wasn't enough evidence in his mind to warrant belief in God, period. As a fledgling freshman, I, along with several others, tried to show him there was ample evidence in Christianity's truth. There were not only facts of fulfilled prophecy and the reliability of the New Testament documents, but also the testimony of creation. Wasn't that sufficient? Not for Alan. Alan was unusually happy to discuss religious subjects, which always gave us Christians a little bit of hope in the midst of it all. But even more intriguing was how he liked to hang out with us. Alan didn't have a whole lot of friends. He was rather unattractive, much too serious, and totally dependent on others for any kind of transportation. But we tried to reach out to him the best we could. Alan knew he could come anytime with us to the beach or on our recurrent midnight runs to Taco Bell. We tried to include Alan in everything we did. And one evening, 
Something happened. A bunch of friends got together to enjoy the sunset and a roaring bonfire. By the time the evening was over, Alan, Alan had made a commitment to Jesus Christ. The next day he came to tell me what happened. I asked him, what, what made you decide? What changed your views? He said, while everyone was sitting around the fire, I realized that whenever I am around you Christians, I am happy. Even when we disagree with each other, I find myself liking to be with Christians. But Alan, I said, I thought you were never going to become a believer unless there was first enough evidence. I still require that. But that's precisely why I now believe. It's how you all love each other that strikes me the most. I never considered that evidence before. A good scientist has to consider all the facts. And I simply haven't found the love you Christians have for each other anywhere else. That's enough evidence for me that Jesus is Lord. Woman, here's your son. John, here's your mother. Saints of Stanford, here is your mission. Amen.